Welcome everyone to this briefing brought to you by the Israel Defense and Security Forum, IDSF. In Hebrew, our name is Abit Chonista. IDSF is the leading Israeli organization advocating for strong national security oriented policies to guide the state of Israel. We are a movement of more than 20,000 people, including many reserve officers and operators from all branches of the Israel Defense Establishment. Thank you, of course, to all of our viewers and supporters for tuning into this briefing, as well as our previous briefings. It is so important to us to be able to bring you this behind the scenes news and analysis on this war here in Israel. There have been so many moving parts to our briefings this week, and I feel like every day we had a plan to bring you one program, and then at the last minute, because of issues here on the ground, things changed. So I know we put out that we'd be joined by an ambassador today, but uh, um, the situation has changed, and we have the great privilege of being joined by Ariel Kahana, um, a correspondent for Israel Hayom. Thank you so much for joining me. Sure. Hello, Michelle. Hello, everyone. So I'm going to, um, as our briefing proceeds, I'm going to share Ariel's, um, I guess, your Twitter handle, your X handle in the uh, in the chat, because I follow what you write. And anyone Thank who you. really wants the inside scoop of what is happening in Israel, it's it's really, it's great to read what you write. If we could start Thank off you. discussing this issue of the aid going into Gaza in UNRWA, meaning on the one hand, uh, Israel feels this need to to solve the humanitarian humanitarian crisis happening unfolding in Gaza. On the other hand, by bringing the aid to UNRWA, by bringing it to Hamas, it's it's feeding the enemy, so to speak. What what can you fill in on this story and share with us? Uh, so again, hello, uh, Moshe and Shalom, everyone. So yes, uh, the UNRWA issue is a very tough one, a very difficult one. So Israel, of course, has decided from the beginning of the war that we will not let the people of Gaza to starve or to suffer. I mean, it's a war. They, they do have, they, they pay the price. By the way, it's, it's, it's uh, worth to remind that most of them supported, still support actually Hamas. They voted for Hamas. They support the ideology, the, the murdered uh, ideology of Hamas and so on. But yet, you know, you have their kids, you have the women, elderly, and so on. And so, of course, we don't want to punish the entire population over there. Yet at the same time, it's a very significant problem is that UNRWA, which is a United Nations agency, which is supported to take care of the refugees in, in, in Gaza and in other places, I'll go into details in a minute. So this agency actually became... Um, I would say another hand of Hamas. Actually, UNRWA, which again is a United Nations agency, UNRWA is Hamas and Hamas is UNRWA. Hamas is controlling all the branches of UNRWA in the Gaza Strip. Um, in hundreds of hundreds of uh, schools, of, um, of health, um, uh, uh, of health uh, places uh, in Gaza, you could, find, you could find terror. You could, you could find, I mean, our soldiers found rockets, ammunition, guns, um, all, all of that, again, in, in United Nation, uh, United Nations area. UNRWA is supposed to take care of the education in Gaza. Not only they are not doing that, uh, not only they are not doing that, just uh, this week I wrote, uh, I, I, I read a report uh, saying that there are many, many analphabet uh, um, um, students in Gaza, uh, which means they don't know how to read. And that is because UNRWA is not doing what it should do regarding education as well. Instead of that, what they do educate for is for killing Jews. For example, um, if they wanna, if they wanna teach um, the kids in Gaza uh, about the second law of Newton, and you you know if, if you throw an apple, what happens to the apple? So instead of that, what they teach them is what happened if you uh, throw maybe a grenade or so. Or, or, or other kind of ammunition, and then what happens? Or what happens if you if you throw a stone over the Zionists, the way they call us? What happened in, in such a, in such a scenario? That's how they teach, uh, uh, in this case, physics in uh, in the Gaza Strip. So 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 UNRWA is actually part of Hamas. Now UNRWA is the only um, power, I would say, in Gaza that these days is able to deliver the, um, all the supply, all the humanitarian supply, the humanitarian aid, 
that uh, many countries, including the United States, are sending to Gaza. And therefore, since Israel, as I said before, since Israel do not want um, the people of Gaza to starve, we have no other choice than than using uh, the, uh, or giving the supply to, to UNRWA. That, that's the problem. That's the dilemma Israel has. So um, that's why just this week uh, we had a senior officer from the army going to Washington and tell him, telling the administration that we want to replace UNRWA. Um, I didn't mention, I had to mention that many, many of the employees of UNRWA were involved in the 7 October massacre. At least we know about 12 uh, employees of UNRWA who crossed the border on October 7. And according to the, to the mobiles, we know they were in the kibbutzim and were in the other places which uh, um, the Gazans killed us, killed the Israelis. So there is no question that at least, and that's the minimum, the number, that at least 12 employees of UNRWA were part of the massacre. There was a, tele, a, telegram, uh, uh, a telegram group, a secret telegram group of 3,000 teachers of UNRWA who celebrated the massacre. And according to the Shin Bet, there are uh, probably uh, 1,200 of uh, of teachers, uh, sorry, 1,200 uh, employees of UNRWA who are at the same time members of Hamas. So that is uh, more than 10% of the employees of UNRWA are also members of Hamas. So all of this tells you how much Hamas and, and UNRWA, as I said before, are connected one to each other. But still, and now, now I'm going back to the dilemma, you have no other agency, no other power in Gaza that you can you can give them the, the supply than UNRWA. There is no other international or aid agency in Gaza today, at least, that you, you can work with. So that's why, although we know, I mean, Israel, although Israel knows that UNRWA is part of Hamas, we have no other choice than giving the, uh, um, delivering the, the supply to UNRWA. That's a very significant dilemma uh, we have. I must say that, um, to me at least, the, the pressures we get from the United States in this issue are very problematic. Um, last, um, last week, the administration uh, halted, at least tem temporarily, the, the, the budgets for, for UNRWA, but it's not final. And I'm not sure what they're going to do in, in a few weeks, if they're going to renew the support to UNRWA or go to another organization, or maybe another structure instead of UNRWA. But, um, but for sure, that is a very, a very a problematic issue. Now, so there is another part, Moshe, I don't know if, you, if we have time for that, but there is, there is another part and a very important one regarding UNRWA. There are actually the United Nations uh, has two um, agencies who take care about refugees around the world. One agency is taking care of the entire world. There are more than, more than 100 million refugees uh, around the world. And there are about 20,000 employees of the United Nations uh, uh, agents, uh, a refugees agency who, who take care about, the, uh, about those uh, 100 million refugees around the world. So it's, it's 20,000 in the entire world or over uh, 100 million refugees. And then the other or the second uh, refugees agency is UNRWA. UNRWA has now is working in four countries or four places, and that is Gaza, Judea and Samaria, or the West Bank, the way you call it, Lebanon, and Jordan. According the, to their numbers, there are 5.6, um, if I'm not wrong, uh, 5.6 million, uh, million refugees uh, who are um, part of UNRWA, who get the help for, from all from UNRWA, as I said, in, in four countries. And in this case, it's 30,000 employees of UNRWA. So it tells you, those numbers are telling you, it's, it's, here it's 30,000 regarding 5 million, and here it's 20,000 regarding 100 million and all around, all around the world. So, so, that, so it tells you about the differences. It's a unique place. Again, there, there is no other agent, refugees agency of the United Nations just related to us, to the, what they call the conflict here. And it tells you the, uh, how much, um, um, I would say, attention the United Nations is, is putting just over here, not equally, not balanced with any other conflict uh, 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 around the world. Now, there is another very major difference 
between the United Nations uh, uh, regular agency of refugees and UNRWA. The United Nations Agency for Refugees, their mission is that, it, that no more than two generations, and usually much less after a few years, the refugees should be reestablished wherever they are. So if you were, I don't know, in the Second World War, refugees from Germany, and you find yourself in France or, I don't know, in Canada, so the United Nations will take care of you to renew your life in Canada. When it comes to the refugees or in, in regarding the conflict here, okay, the Palestinian refugees, there is no renewing of life. Their um, refugees uh, um, uh, position another. And that's the reason you have now it's the fifth generation of refugees since 1949. Jeez, it's, it's a father's, or at least grand grandmother's, and so on. So it's, it's, it tells you how much all, all this um, all this structure is ridiculous because they do not take care of the refugees. What they do they ca take care for is to incite against Israel. And those are major, major problems we have. Actually, UNRWA is not a tool to solve the conflict. It's a, it's a tool to promise the conflict will go on for decades and for, for generations to come unless uh, this issue of UNRWA will be solved. So because of those two major problems, maybe three, which one is cooperating with terror, Second, uh, educating for terror. And three, um, um, uh, taking the problem from one generation to, to another. Now, there is kind of beginning of understanding, I would say, in some parts of the international community, in America and in other places, that URA is, again, is not a solution. It's part of the problem. I don't know where it will go to. I hope very much that Israel and the United States and maybe, may, maybe other countries will do what has to be done in the coming weeks and replace UNRWA. Again, UNRWA has to be replaced with an agency that will take care of, real care of the problem and will try to solve the problem and not to guarantee the problem will go on for, for many years many years to come. We have a few weeks to, to, make, to, to fix it, actually. I hope it will happen uh, in, in the coming days. And a lot of that is is, is depending on, uh, on on the United uh, and, uh, sorry in, in the United uh, United States. Again, I hope it will happen in in the coming weeks. And um, it, it is possible. Maybe last point about about that. It's possible because UNRWA used to be working in Syria, and during the um, the civilian war in Syria in the last decade, the previous decade. It was replaced with other organizations. So it tells you it's possible to replace UNRWA. UNRWA. You just have to want or decide you're doing it. So that's my, uh, I would say, a general statement about uh, about UNRWA. So when we when we talk about humanitarian aid from Israel going into Gaza and reasons that there's a large group of Israelis trying to block that aid, so your focus is on UNRWA. You're saying that Israel gives the aid to, to UNRWA and UNRWA is an agent of Hamas, so we're in effect supplying the enemy. But let me ask you just a, a moral question. Let, let's say there was an alternative to UNRWA. Does, does Israel have a moral obligation to supply the, the civilian population of Gaza during wartime? Israel is at war with Hamas. Does Israel have a moral obligation to supply the civilians within Gaza aid? Meaning if we got rid of the UNRWA problem, would, would that still be a requirement? No question that Israel uh, is trying to handle the war in the most moral way we can. It's a war. It's tough. It's very hard. If, of course, everyone saw pictures of those people who lost their houses, and, and I I'm, I'm feel sorry for that. But at the same time, you know, Moshe, it's very important to emphasize between Hamas and, and the civilians. But the truth is, can you hear me well, Moshe? Okay. So, but the, the truth is, there is no such separation. It doesn't mean that every person in Gaza should be punished, not at all. But we, we do have to face the problem the way it is. 
Hamas was elected in a democratic way by the people of Gaza in 2006. There was never, during those uh, 18 years, 19 years, not even one time any kind of, of fight or rebel or demonstrations against Hamas in Gaza. The, the people of Gaza were quite okay with the regime, with the brutal regime of, of Hamas. Okay? It, it, it must be said. And as we saw, according to the polls, they support what Hamas did. They support the massacre. Everyone could hear the celebrations in Gaza in October 7 and the days, in the days after. Just now, after Israel came, and and you know, and, and we we did what we what we have to do. Now they're beginning to understand what suffer Hamas brought them. But originally they supported and maybe still support Hamas. At the same time, they are people, they live, they are human beings, and we respect that. And we, of course, we have no you know collective punishment and so on. We it's we are not doing such things, no way. So whether it's UNRWA or any other organization, we will take care in the, in the best moral way we can that people who shouldn't suffer will not suffer. But at the same time, if we know, and we know that the supply go, go to, it goes to Hamas, the truck in from Israel or from Egypt to Gaza, immediately is being taken pictures we know it's true that's the way it goes so have you ever heard about a country that's sending supply to the enemy during a war i think it's immoral to behave this way and so again we have a conflict we don't want people who are not clearly terrorists we don't want them to suffer but at the same time it doesn't make sense we will help our enemy so that's a very serious dilemma. Everybody here are talking about it. And again, I hope in the coming weeks, we, coming weeks, we, we could, could find a solution. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the current deal being proposed uh, with Hamas. Are you able to kind of update us on, on the details of the deal, what's been rejected, what's on the table? And then more importantly, contrast this deal with, with, with that first deal that happened. So... Um, it seems to me is it going to be a deal, maybe not next week, but there's one after. Um, there are talks taking place today in Cairo once again. Actually, these days we we are waiting to hear what will uh, Hamas, uh, how will Hamas reply um, to the, let's call it general principles that were decided in, in the beginning of the week in a meeting that took place in, in, in uh, Paris between the head of the Mossad, the head of the CIA, and the uh, senior officials from Egypt and Qatar. So now the ball is in uh, Hamas hands and, and, and by the way, the uh, Islamic Jihad as well. Now, contrary to the previous uh, deal, which was hard as well for us, this time it's going to be much, much harder. First of all, what is sure at the moment, I can tell you, we are talking about a um, uh, pause of the war, one day pause of the war for every hostage. That means there are, there are now we know about 136 hostages that Hamas still holds. So let's say they will just give us 30. It means one month that Israel will stop the war. That's a very problematic, um, a very pro problematic move by us. I'm not sure Israel will, will prove it, but you ask me what is that's on, that's on the table. It's, it, it has to be said that's on the table. But the higher price, uh, price, Moshe, is going to be the terrorists that we will have to send free from jail. Unfortunately, I'm talking about terrorists, I'm talking about murderers, I'm talking about people who had a lot of blood on their hands. And if the IDF will not find the hostages in the tunnels of Gaza in the coming days, um, in one week or two weeks, two weeks, we will have uh, no other problem, no other choice than to go. Um, to this to this awful deal, and we are talking that's going to be at least hundreds of hundreds of terrorists and 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 murderers that will go free, unfortunately, um, because we can't let our our, our uh, people. Uh, I mean, I'm this the Israelis, the hostages. We can't let them to die in Gaza in in, in hands. 
So that's again a very a very tough dilemma uh, we have here. We we can't we can't we can't let let them die uh, over there. But at the same time, the price we will probably have to pay um, for them is very high, and 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 we come back in the future because experience tells us once you once you let terrorists go free, many of them are coming back to terror. You know, many have noted that after the first ceasefire, there was a change in the way Israel responded and picked the war back up in Gaza. Is that a big concern now for a second ceasefire? With whatever deal is made, will things just kind of fizzle out in terms of the IDF's operations in Gaza? So um, it's it's not accurate in a way the the army the idf had its plans about uh, how the war will, will will go since i would say not day one but day seven let's say so about a week after the war began there was the were those plans and it was approved uh, in in the cabinet and and the army is is moving forward according to the to the plans um the problem or another problem i would say with the coming deal or the coming uh, yeah the coming deal is uh, um, is the intentions of the other players behind the scenes, or maybe even not so much behind. And I'm talking about Qatar, I'm talking about the United States, and also about, about Egypt. It says formally that the deal is just for letting the hostages go free, which everyone wants. And the prices, as I said before, are very high. But the American intention and the Qatari intention is that the this deal will actually take us to the end of the war without without eliminating Hamas. It will not be said publicly. Um, the Americans would probably tell us, Israelis, no, you gave Hamas, you, you punished them very strongly. They're almost dead. Uh, you did what you have to do, and that's enough. But, um, but that's not true. The truth is that Hamas definitely is suffering a lot from the IDF, but not enough. We didn't break them yet. To be very sincere, we didn't break them yet, so there's still a lot of work to do. But the administration, on one hand, wants us to fight, helps us a lot, a lot of uh, military supply day after day. But at the same time, they want Israel to stop the war, maybe from political reasons. I'm not sure what the reasons are, but but what, what is sure is that the administration wants this deal actually to end the war. So I said before, if we have, and we have um, uh, 136 um, hostages, at least uh, we know about 100 of them who should be alive. It tells you that we are talking about 100 days of, of, um, of uh, stopping the war, of hunting the war. That's a very, very uh, high price to pay. And it might take us to a point we don't want and that is to stop the world completely. Uh, so again, it's, it, it might be a very problematic result of this, of this uh, deal. I, I hope we will not get there. So just, just so I understand you clearly, you, you think we should not make a deal? Because it's interesting, as I, as I view the people writing in on the chat, all of our amazing followers and supporters in the U.S. and around the world. They all see as it a given that this is a horrible deal. Israel should run away from it and continue the fight. When I talk with senior military people, they're not that clear in terms of running away from this deal. So what do you think? Should Israel just keep fighting and, and let the hostages die? Or should Israel make this deal even though there are very dire prices to pay? So, so the difference, Moshe, between you and me and and the officers uh, in the IDF is that we do not have the intelligence uh, they do. But generally speaking, my feeling is that we should try to delay and delay the deal as much as we can, and let the army keep work, working. Uh, I, maybe I have to remind everyone that um, that we are still not in in Rafa. Okay, there is another major city in the Gaza Strip. So the IDF is not acting over there, uh, at least not fully in full power. And, and maybe there, the hostages are, are over there, in, in the tunnels over there with Sinwal. So I, I mean, if again, according to what I know now, I would say, let's wait another month, 
do what you have to do or what you can do in Rafa and try to bring them from there because the deal is very, very problematic as we, as we discussed before. But at the same time, you have, you have uh, more than 100, 100 people who are over there. It's, it's, it's our citizens, it's our people, it's our brothers and sisters, and we have to bring them back. It's, it's a horrifying dilemma, I would say, but in one way or another, it has to be solved. All right, I really appreciate your time and all of your insights. We're almost out of time. I want to ask one question, which we can't figure out in the next two minutes, so it'll be a cliffhanger. Um, but there you know, have been letters being circulated from the government that Israelis should prepare uh, for an escalation in the north and prepare for life for a certain amount of time without power and make certain plans accordingly. All of these negotiations and discussions in Gaza and a ceasefire, do you think that empowers Hezbollah in the north and increases the chances of war or or puts them on hold to see what will happen in Gaza? The deal, if it will take place, the deal is actually another tool by the administration to avoid uh, a war in the north. That's another reason why they push for it so uh, so strongly. So again, I mean, I don't know to tell you how it will end, and uh, and we do prepare ourselves for a war with Hezbollah, which probably will be much much tougher even than the current one. But um, but um, the deal might actually might actually avoid, as I said, avoid the war in the north. That's at least what the administration wants to do. And and let's see let's see where it will go to. Thank you so much for joining Thank you, me. Michelle. Thank you, everyone. All of this with our viewers. Thank you to all of our viewers and supporters. I did add in the chat the uh, Twitter handle, which is Arik, A-R-I-K 3000, correct? Correct. So everyone is, of course, welcome to follow Thank you. Thank you. you. You write in Hebrew and also in English, I think, in, on Twitter. I write uh, mostly in Hebrew. Oh, mostly Hebrew. Yeah, yeah, but but if you want to go, if you, I, I, but I do have a, a Telegram channel in in English. If you want to go into it, and also to Israel Hayom in English, uh, my articles are being published uh, over there, israelhayom.com. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you to all of our Thank viewers. You. We'll be back with you 10 a.m. Eastern time on Monday. Until then, stay safe, stay strong, take care, everyone. Thank you.